Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start with a poem. I was thinking a lot about exile and ostracism and making lonely decisions as an individual and sort of started obsessing about all these people who fled from Germany uh, before the Second World War with the Nazi, in the Nazi time. And there's a very interesting story of Brecht, uh, who when he left was very attached to um, a painting he had. It was like rolled up like a tapestry and he was so in love with this painting that he took it everywhere he went. He traveled from place to place in, in exile and literally in every uh, place he was, he hung this thing over his desk. And this was actually an old painting, uh, a Chinese tapestry uh, called The Doubter. And I'm very much interested in the question of doubting a system in the sort of metadata context. Um, what does it actually mean to look at what you're doing, what makes us do what we're doing, and gives him enough motivation. And the story of the, the doubter is, uh, for Brecht, it was, um, I'll try and paraphrase the German poem. Um, anytime we try to find an answer to the story, um, we would, or had, had finished a process, uh, we would unravel this tapestry and take a look at this old man who's just giving us this critical look. And um, he was sitting on a bench and he was doubting so much that the picture was saying to us, I'm the doubter, I'm doubting that your work that has consumed your time and your efforts has been, has been worthwhile. And so they looked at the painting, uh, the doubting man on the, on the tapestry, we looked at ourselves and we started over again. And I was thinking about these stories of exile uh, even before prison broke. And I think now with Snowden, we have a new kind of narration which is very much attached to the individual, to the sort of hero breaking out of the system, which is a narration or a trajectory that this story takes, which is touching and immediately recognizable to, to all of us. Um, which also is very much about doubting. And I saw a l bit of similarity, or maybe at least I still wanted to start out with this Brecht, because I think in a way it's, it's connected um, to what the sort of exile and ostracism experience may be in a sort of hacker activism setting. Um, I think what we have is a trajectory, we, through narrations and through choices we make, saying now is the time to get out of the NSA and clear this shit up. Um, there is a kind of vectorization in this, in this sense. The whole debate about living well, uh, being comfortable with, with what you're doing, is sort of turned into this directive thing, which I think does distinguish it from other, like, psychologically better explained emotions. Um, and that's also why the research um, under the like heading, it's always termed not happiness, but a general well-being. Very often shortened to GWB, three letter acronyms. So for the context of this talk, I'm, I've tried to use the mental hashtag WOB, which is just like um, the metric we're trying to find metrics for something which is very messy, um, very hard to see, and very targeted. And actually, in fact, happiness is an emotion which isn't hardly ever experienced situationally, but more in retrospect and along these, these lifelines. And I see if you do have something um, where you're heading, uh, this is even in the word. We don't say, I'm happy now, we say um, the pursuit of happiness. In, in some contexts, even the, the, a right to a pursuit of happiness. That's not an emotion. That's a vector or a target. And I think we see a lot of this is how we make sense of our lives. Um, what Aristotle called the telos, like the, the goal. Um, 
it's a very difficult thing because apparently happiness is something we're all uh, like aiming for, but so we have the direction of the vector, but we still really don't know what it is. And so this leads to very messy kind of research. Mm. And of course, also um, to a very sort of overgeneralization. So a lot of what we see in, in sort of well-being, happiness, um, tr more sort of academic or social psychology approaches is, um, well, overgeneralization. That's a general problem of big data anyway. And immediately in all this, we're in the very how to live your life well, you know, 50 best tips from whatever um, distinguished people. And a lot of this is very much cliche. Um, I think it's a sort of sweeping heuristics and how to, how to live your life that's often very like smug. And um, this actually makes it quite difficult to approach from a sort of philosophical point of view because in fact what was anciently the, the target which was the pursuit of happiness which was founded very much in the social um, social sphere um, and for instance in the Greek tradition is like now just a private business we don't really know what to do with so this is limited to well-meaning um, recommendations you know you know the sort of thing how to how to live live well and um, so we have the strange situation that on the one hand um, Academia is saying, "What's this? What's this mushy, messy, uh, squishy, squishy thing?" Um, and they don't really want to focus on it. For instance, uh, I mean, the French in particular, they, they don't uh, like the idea at all. Uh, Lyotard, for instance, um, went to great lengths to show why this is a stupid idea by, in fact, he wanted to show this isn't really something we should be concerning our minds with. And so to say, never mind, he, never mind happiness or eudaimonia, the, the, the end goal of, of, um, of, of uh, the pursuit of happiness. Um, he goes on to like discard Aristotle idea of tel teleology, uh, teleological development, like moving towards a target, because it feels so sort of intelligent design-like. Um, but the rest of the world, like the common public, it's something everyone knows, and everyone's like, okay, happiness, um, how can I get me some? And so there's this great discrepancy in the sort of research motivation, and um, I think that's just... Um, the kind of development that this is sort of becoming more than an emotion that's not researched as, as other emotions are. And there's quite a lot of um, current research which, which proves that uh, this is quite a, an independent form or is expressed differently than other emotions which we're a lot, a lot easily able to feel at the uh, in the in the current moment, and connecting this to, to Snowden and to sort of the heroic uh, doubting figure in the in the nerd community, um, there's this very strong phenomenon I've found speaking to a lot of people. Um, it's called imposter syndrome, and it's basically this idea: if you're an intellectual worker, if you're a thinker and not doing any like visible production work. Mm. David Foster Wallace said in a commencement address to students, don't be, don't be fooled by this or don't be scared like this. It's quite natural that at some point you're going to feel like a fraud. You're, a, a, you're an imposter. You're not doing anything for your money sort of thing. And um, because nowadays all these measures of well-being are trying to are being generalized, are being um, put in a sort of larger context. We have all this 
gross national happiness or international metrics and measurements for this, mm, the individual is sort of coming out of, out of the picture. And if you then have a situation like an activist, um, there are feedback channels lacking there. So you're a sort of lone figure, uh, there are no feedback channels, and no real sort of immediate recognition for, for the work you're doing. And if we're talking about well-being as a sort of generalized way how we feel about our lives, about the sense and the meaningfulness of what we're doing, um, I think, um, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of um, taking a step back. So it's, it's very hard to get out of this system, in particular, if, if you're an individual, and to say at what point is the moment I don't want to stay any longer in this job, the costs outweigh the benefits, um, that just there's a tipping point reached, I have to go out of this. And if we, uh, you heard the opening speech by um, the former CIA guy, he was saying, saying things like this also. Um, amazingly, you have, only have to have the choice of remaining in the system or going into exile. And because work is actually such a meaningful part of, of, of what we're doing. It's actually also a big, big factor in all these measurements of social cohesion, well-being, general happiness indices and so on. And um, that, in fact, employment itself is quite a, a lively feature in, in all kinds of GWUB indexes. Um, that, just, that just means that um, Well, there's an imbalance. What, what we're seeing um, is that happiness, in fact, is like, for instance, um, you know this guy? Anyone recognize him? Well, he's actually a behavioral scientist um, and neu neurologist. Um, his name is Dan Ariely. And uh, he almost got burnt to a crisp as a young guy doing some religious ceremony. And this experience, you can still see some scars, uh, actually got him to ask some serious questions about uh, decision making, life choices, and, and also more hedonic uh, philosophy, more general economics, decision-making, and like well-being related questions due to personal experience. And this is something that, that uh, happens a lot because there's this constant interaction of, of both spheres. Um, if, you, if you know um, Hannah Arendt's Vita Activa, that's the active life, that was the title she was actually meaning for it to have in the English translation also. Uh, she says quite simply that what we know now, as the, know now as the social sphere is in fact just like an intermediate layer between the private and the public, and everything else is negotiated in between. So the social isn't like really a sphere in itself, but just a sort of buffer zone where these negotiations take place. And also political action is central in the social living. So ac being active socially is for Hannah Arendt being political. And I think if you have something like eudaimonia, or how do we live well, in the ancient polis, this was much more integrated. Um, the, the circles weren't as, weren't as distinct, and we couldn't be active politically, socially, or even privately without this uh, interacting with the polis and the public sphere also. And I think what's... Um, Mike? Ah, <laughs> sorry. It, 
if we see what someone like Dan Ariel is doing, he's, he's, uh, he's saying, why don't we try and integrate some of these areas we're looking at? Because that's precisely the problem. The, these interactions are, are so messy, and there's always um, a lot of tension between the individual happiness and the, the gross national success of, of policies or uh, of social schemes. Mm. Everything is sort of negotiated in this social area, and that's what I was trying to um, locate in the sort of big data approach, because what we see now, we have something like OKCupid okay or FetLife. Uh, I don't know if you know that, but in a way that's um, very comparable to the, to the emotional metrics we have and, and systems. So because, like for instance, happiness or GWUB is such a, uh, such a messy thing, we're trying very hard to find individual data points. It's, it's navigated by a lot of factors and in particular by limiting factors. So you have a general well-being index for cancer patients. Now you have 50. I'll show you, I'll show you a paper. which is a meta-analysis. So we're still on the, if we're, we're talking on a meta, meta data level, what people do is just compile all these indices and all these metrics to try and find, make sense out of this by just aggregating. Obviously this isn't, doesn't work, I'll try and explain in a moment why. But um, just to give you an impression, I just like to scroll through the, 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 the list of contents. So we have, health-related quality of life concepts, and then just lots of factors which could possibly retain or prevent that, that happiness or well-being or health. And so we have sections for cancers, and you can see here lots of three, four, five-letter acronyms. This is just chemotherapy. So how well do you deal with leukemia? So psychiatric conditions, but also, like I said, things like unemployment. So you have a highly, highly uh, s specialized way of positioning yourself and trying by finding tiny data points in this ex extraordinarily complex um, matrix. That's why I was trying to compare it to these OKCupid okay um, instance that uh, if with Hannah Arendt, where sort of the social web is just a, a transitional thing, we are constantly negotiating our identities in this with our with our profile pictures. And I'm interested to see what, um, like, you know, these My Little Pony guys or people who do these four character My Myers Briggs personality tests. Um, it's it's a great need to specify where you're actually in, but there's no sense of the big picture. And that's what I meant. It's like a ve vector with a direction, but without really knowing what the value is. Um, so just to, to see social dysfunction, rating scale, adjustment scale, health and daily living form, there are lots of interesting approaches to this, but strangely enough, they're all sort of defined negatively. And I think... of um, of this happiness research in particular, uh, that you get a sort of aggregated, personal, messy bl blob of stuff that you're trying to make something out of. And in a way, that's obviously treating uh, an emotion as, as a resource that you can allocate, that you can um, distribute or n trade. And um, there are a lot of tri uh, trials to do this on a national scale. I think that's a sort of one little step further down, but this is still on a very big, generalized, big, big data scale. Maybe you've heard of Bhutan, which is like um, national, the, the most, the happiest country in the world, allegedly, although um, several of the like Happy Planet indexing systems, uh, statistic sites that uh, try and do other number crunching systems don't even include uh, include uh, Bhutan, but um, it at least has a state 
organize a system uh, for this. And um, it's quite interesting. Some Austrian guys, uh, this was uh, an Austrian lady who told me about this film. They went there to observe how these administrators go into all the villages in Bhutan and try to uh, discover how this is actually enforced, right? Because you can have something, you can have a, have a social or political directive. Tony Blair, a couple of years ago, said he wanted to do the same thing for the UK. And everyone was like, ha ha, in the tabloids and said, didn't you read this book in the 70s? by whoever, whoever it was, A Thousand Suns, I think it's called, uh, which was a social dystopia where people wanted to do exactly that and it ended in a big mess because it's coming from the wrong direction and we don't actually know where we are in this sort of structural setting. So what's, what's the access point for, for measures? It's not clear at all. And a lot of this is just, it may be a lot of data, a lot of research, a lot of numbers, a lot of statistics, a lot of countries compared, or are people you know, with big thighs better off, or are people without a job better off, or are you happier in California uh, than, than w uh, anywhere else in the world? And if you want to know the answer to the California thing, the answer is no. It's something that a Nobel Prize winner, Daniel Kahneman, discovered. But um, the thing is, people in California aren't actually happier than people I than in, in Minnesota or whatever the, the com uh, comparison state was. But the point is that people in Minnesota think people in C California are a lot happier than them. So it's always a matter of, of finding a metric, uh, a target. Um, and this is also, I think, where this Bhutan thing com comes in. And the whole question of how can we evaluate uh, s standardize or analyze this whole thing at all. Uh, the situation in the documentary was these guys coming like anthropologists or just nosy reporters coming and saying, um, well, how about your neighbor? Do you fight with him? You seem to be so relaxed. And he's like, no. And he says, well, but how about your cow? It's going on your neighbor's grass and eating it. And he's like, yeah. And he says, well, do you have, have conflict with your neighbor because of the cow? No. Well, but he, he's eating on his lawn. Yeah. And so it con continues. And so just maybe, again, you have the sort of Margaret Mead problem or Livy Strauss, I think, all sort of responsible question-asking people should always have this in mind. The role of the observer isn't impartial at all. But just by um, placing this kind of question there, um, you're saying there is a potential for conflict. We're saying, um, and that's where I'm trying to go into like the more social, social sphere, like the, the network setting, which I think is more interesting than the, uh, than the meta governmental over, overarching setting, um, precisely for the re reason that, we, that it is a network structure and that enables learning and exchange in a different way. Um, so if, if we look at uh, Hannah Arendt's distinction, which I, which I still think is really meaningful today, um, we see that we're exactly in this, in this middle bit. Um, <laughs> what uh, this, this guy, Dan Ariely, for instance, did, um, relates immediately to my initial uh, thought on, on, on Snowden. Um, it's how meaningful is it what we do? And that's a great source of, of contentment and well-being and personal stability because it just means exactly that. What I meant with the lifeline, the trajectory, is that we're constantly checking and rechecking and looking back. and. Um, Dan Ariely did quite interesting tests with people. He let them build little like Lego robots, and basically did two setups. Uh, the one in which like the little robo toy was destroyed immediately after, and they could again, you know, do you want to carry on building for a bit more money or a bit less? Or they tried different things out, but basically they had two setups. One was a like meaningful production, and the other one was somehow futile, pointless, and 
coming, coming back to you. And this really harks, harks back to Hannah Arendt's distinction, I think, who was the first to say uh, work and labor and political activism isn't the th same thing at all. And um, so the social is, is the sphere where we can enact these things, where, where sort of learning uh, can be achieved just by, just by meshing. And um, yeah, so that's why I'm trying to say that uh, the social is more like a communication protocol between these spheres. And it, I think um, it is a political category because like what we see with Snowden, wh when does the point come where this is just too pointless? Like how many robo toys do I have to build until I say stop? And um, if you think of, of the like modern thinkers like Camus saying, uh, we have to imagine uh, Sisyphus as a happy person. Um, what does that even mean? It just means like uh, deal with the futility and um, find some find some meaning wherever you see it. And what uh, what Hannah Arendt does is is remarkable, really, because it's putting these networks uh, in a very strong position, but giving t giving leeway to to both sides and. Um, if you're doing something like working for the NSA, uh, building stupid toys, and you just think, this doesn't work anymore, what's, what's heroic? Uh, it was Hannah Arendt who pointed out that Sisyphus was, uh, was just um, pushing, uh, well, pushing this, up the, uh, pushing this up the wrong hill. Um, but she also, <laughs> also went on to compare this with other heroic tasks, which she's, she said are actually quite menial. So she didn't pick uh, Sisyphus as an example, but uh, Hercules, uh, one of his tasks was to clear out the stables of this guy, but the thing is the shit just kept back piling on. So, uh, <laughs> and, but no comparison with the NSA there, but it's just <laughs> if you're in this system and you're trying to clear this whole thing out, the futility is in the system, and basically you have no choice but to leave that. And I think the only um, intermediate point is exactly the social um, or the connectivity between uh, that we have more than what, what uh, Mr. McGovern said yesterday, like take it or leave it, that there has to be some connection between the metadata and the individual, like a sort of feedback loop coming from that, so that there is a way to uh, produce meaningfulness within the system. And that's the difficulty. So, I think what we see here is um, kind of, I don't know, do you, uh, Daniel Kahneman is a really interesting guy. Um, it's extremely helpful to uh, use his distinction, I find, he, between um, what he calls the experiencing self and the remembered self. And this goes back to the sort of vectors to the traje trajectory and to the time factor. Because what we do the whole time, a lot of the happiness research is actually done in retrospect. Actually, one of the more, more meaningful studies of, of uh, Kahneman was in fact called uh, the day recreation method, DRM. Again, three-letter acronym. That one's used also, but um, it has this other meaning. and. Um, People were asked to evaluate how well they did at certain tasks, um, but in ret retrospect, a day after. And so he says we should really distinguish between um, the experience himself in terms of emotion. Uh, like, if you were to ask, are you happy now? It's very hard to answer. You always say in sort of memory and a sort of distinction, and this is your uh, remembering self acting here. So, and not your experiencing self, and I think this is also where the trajectories come in. We are constantly making these narrations as we go along. And what was interesting about the, the Kahneman research is that um, he asked uh, women only, in, all of them employed, about uh, 900 in the original study. This was end of 90s, I think, um, or mid-90s, um, how 
happy are they with different aspects of their lives, and in particular by checking tasks. So they said, like, when you're doing the housework yesterday, how well did you feel when you were doing, when you were commuting, when you were working? And so what they did is uh, they generated out of all of these um, questionnaires, they generated a kind of perfect day um, schedule. So, and this again was turned into a meta-analysis quite recently last year by some German researchers and was very widely publicized and also um, misrepresented very much as here's what to do if you want to have a perfect day. And it started out with like have 90 minutes of um, sex, which is pretty good, but obviously this is idealized and not normalized. So if all these ladies were just to organize their day by enjoyment or remembered enjoyment, um, we would have quite different sort of setup of everyday life. Um, so personal, quite really intimate relations and social relations were pretty top on the list. Uh, work only featured like about 40 to 90 minutes, uh, computer work plus. And so um, this obviously doesn't mean we should, you know, lie in bed all day and have, have sex <laughs> instead of working. But as work is such a large part of our lives already, uh, we have like the, the metric to, to make something out of this. And I think um, to make more noticeable or meaningful settings, there's a lot being done um, in, the, in the social area. I've been working with a lot of people in sort of hacker and activist circles in the last past year or so. Um, and from the, from the initial, um, like you said in the introduction, uh, problem consciousness, it's turned into quite a snowballing um, how to, what can we share, what metrics can we find, what share experiences can we find. There have been quite a lot of ideas sort of bubbling and pooling and getting together and I'd really like to um, point out what Mitch Altman has been doing in the past year with the, in the sort of hacker space. Um, he's got all these people together. He started with the Geeks and Depression, Geeks and Mental Health panel on the Congress uh, before last and has really opened the community, I feel, for a more sort of open debate. Um, if, if you start something like that, it's very much, uh, Mitch just told me, he, it's very much attached to his person. They've been doing literal meetups, like a little support group or just uh, a structure, experience cha structure. Um, but still, it's the sort of context and the setting is needed. So the social net, I think, has to be more of a safety net also by virtue of its structure. And I think that that can be established on a lot of channels, but a lot of people are doing this. And if, for nerds, it's very, it's quite, uh, well, I think a lot of them can relate to exactly this way of analyzing yourself and maybe sharing experiences. Um, because maybe if you're by tendency under service by, by conventional psychology, um, which is often the case in, in this sort of exiled uh, hacker, I'm socially ostracized anyway um, setting. I think a lot of people tend to try and find the help for their, for their problems or their lack of well-being or mental health issues like within themselves, but there's a limit to what you can learn by self-analysis. And I think that's why the sort of going back from, from general to individual data back to generalized data is such an important loop uh, in this. Um. So, what, for instance, people like Meredith Patterson are doing, they're actually trying to find concrete measures to uh, share experiences, but also maybe heuristics and how-to manuals that aren't quite as patronizing because uh, recently someone tweeted something like, you know all these geeks with depression, um, they would be a lot less depressed if you guys didn't keep 
you know, posting smart ass remarks about depression. And that's, I think, the problem we have with the sort of um, generalized kitchen psychology, but also the big data. We have something like the a uh, new statistical manual of, of uh, diagnostics, the DSM uh, number five it is now. There was a lot of debate. Are we, you know, finding more and more little kinks, sub kinks and kinks of kinks, etc. Uh, just doing too much little, little disorders and pathologizing people which shouldn't actually belong in, in that, in that uh, domain. But I think um, this is, well, <laughs> Ice cream, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but I'm maybe. Um, well, actually, exactly. That was l the ice cream was my uh, individual scale because that's like the the savior of, of hedonism on on a sort of individual psychological scale. That um, I don't know. Do you know the Ben and Jerry's advert? It says like our secret recipe is just much too much of everything, and. Um, Hedonism is a bit like that. So you have the chalk with the chocolate ice cream and the chocolate sprinkles. And, um, but it's not in fact, a, a, there is a limit, like if you just eat ice cream all day. So a lot of you people who probably know more about cybernetics than I do, it's obvious that like uh, the whole is more than the sum of its parts. So the ingredients don't actually uh, tell you anything, but that's uh, like the answer of hedonism. I think you can learn a lot from that also. But um, my point was more uh, remaining in the social sphere or feeding back individual hedonistic or anti-hedonistic lack of thereof experience like back into the social system. Um, and I think there's a lot of ways, ways forward there. For instance, um, Meredith and another guy from the UK, for instance, were trying out this idea of um, can we compile just available information into a kind of geek m mental health and well-being, uh, you know, world coping how-to, uh, sort of Reddit style. You know, like there's a drug forums where people just share their experiences, but there's also like a, an editing aspect that you can evaluate the, the helpfulness of experiences. So from a sort of, in a lot of, for instance, the LGBTQ community, as I think, has that sort of has that sort of thing. But um, okay, we're almost out of time. Uh, well, like I said, a lot of nerds tend towards self-analysis and self-help, self-therapy, and I think like feeding it back into the social sphere in exactly these forms is a way out of that. Um, there's no harm in observing yourself, but you need an, also the information has to come from somewhere, and I think uh, the sort of Reddit concept is pretty helpful here because it gives you an evaluation possibility, and that can be very helpful to just look at available data, what we have. Like, this isn't a mushy, soppy, you know, off-topic business. This is really how do I feel in my everyday from one-to-one -one life. And I think um, it's quite important to pinpoint and maybe ask yourself these questions. And also people are starting to observe this on a more, uh, yeah, like I said, data-oriented scale. So that's what I was trying to say with like private or small data aspect, which can then like re-contribute to the, to the overall general perspective. Um, people are starting in, in Berlin, there are cyborgs who are measuring their own brain waves and trying to learn stuff from that. And these kind of feedbacks, I think just observing yourself is, is, a, is a big thing if you're not willing to you know, go out to the step and look for professional help for your issues. It's always a matter of like negotiation, but um, even if many like geeks don't want to acknowledge it and say, oh, I'm all about my, I need my alone time, or this is off topic and I'm not uh, targeting anyone with this, um, there's still a lot of benefit in, in talking. Um, 
But even so, observe yourself and fi try to extrapolate and try to find metrics and try to find uh, connectivities and ways to evaluate this. And I think um, these, these questions will, will yeah, formulate or find their own sort of ways of, of materializing or of, um, well, being spread more easily. And this is what I really, I'd like to close with another doubter. <laughs> um, again here, it's, it's all, the meta perspective is never easy because you're always embedded in some part of this big mess. Um, but trying to take that step back and uh, being critical and being a system critical is, is, a, is a function of, of emotional well-being, I think. Um, if you look at old philosophy, if you see someone like uh, Pascal, who wrote the Pensée, which, like I said, the ancient wisdom, it's all clichés, it's all, you know, put it on a little calendar to tear off one day after another, but still there's... I mean, like XKCD, we all love XKCD because it's profound and totally superficial and awesome at the same time. <laughs> um, but I think the sort of happiness data is a lot like this. We all find something individual to attach to. Everyone's an expert, like with the DSM number five, I think now we have sort of complete <laughs> pathologization and so we're all, we're all uh, psychologizing each other sort of thing. But, um, well, no harm in that, but still I like to stick to like more network or hard, hard data and I don't think uh, this is a slushy emotion at all, but it's rather quite a, quite a sturdy, sturdy everyday thing. And, um, but asking yourself constantly with a minute in behind saying, with the, the hindsight, with the remembering self, saying, was I happy yesterday? Just looking back. And if you're Ed Snowden or if you're Aaron Schwartz, Schwartz you just know there's a limit at some point. At some point, you won't be able to look back and say, OK, I'm still OK with this, I'm still OK with this. So that's the element of doubt, just taking that step back out of uh, all the sort of meta, meta analysis. And the first doubt was actually um, this guy from Thrace. Uh, was it Democrit? I'm not sure. I'll look it up. But um, oh no, it was Lukian of Abdera from, from Thrace. He was the first guy to um, well, express doubt in the haunt. There, there was like this local cemetery and uh, people were all spooked out and he was the, the first one there who pointed out um, these are just, you know, kids with black gowns and, and skulls, masks. Um, I'm not scared. It's not, you know, something supernatural. He went there and he pointed it out and said, these are just guys in black masks. I doubt what you're saying. These, and this is where I think this comes back to Snowden's and all, the element of doubt in, in activism and day-to-day -day living altogether, that just you ask yourself, at what point do, uh, do I say this isn't like, um, just acknowledge the spooks for what they are. And there are sort of haunting, haunting elements if you... If you think of uh, Vonnegut, who said famously in Slaughterhouse Five, uh, "I don't want my sons to make uh, m machinery for massacres," um, we s we still have that. Um, it's still a matter of living well and doubting, and making maybe maybe a moral decision, taking that step back, and pointing the spook out for what it is, and. Pascal said. We're, we're nothing, like the universe could crush us in an instant, but we have consciousness. And that gives us like a moral obligation to think well. That's what it's like, is all uh, what is like meaningful is that's like almost a cognitive ethics or computational ethics even, because that's just the requirement to be critical, to think well. And if you're Snowden saying, I don't want to make massacre machinery, and 
Vonnegut closes and says, don't let your sons and daughters make massacre machinery. And I would like just to carry on this element of doubt on and to take a step backward and make sure. I hope you all live well, think well, and our sons and daughters and AR drones never make them make massacre machinery like that. Thank so you. So 